back. This is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. Welcome to Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. I'm Joanne Sutton. Today we're speaking with Jim Doyle, Senior Financial Consultant with Investors Group Financial Services, and we're talking about ways to start the new year armed with fresh perspective. Look forward to starting 2016 on the right track financially. And Jim is here to help you do that. So Jim, I, I really appreciate the rich perspective that you're bringing to our conversations today on account of all these different designations that you hold. And you have designations that I wouldn't normally associate with your type of work. You are a certified financial planner, a chartered life underwriter, a registered trust and a state practitioner, a certified divorce financial analyst, as well as a certified international wealth manager. You're also a graduate of the UBC Sauter School of Business Family Enterprise Advisor Program. Jim, I actually think it's quite rare to see this many designations. Is this all part of your commitment to bringing substantive value to your clients? Well, you know, after 26 years in practice, I understand that no one person can know everything. However, these designations allow me to have insight on issues that impact client lives. Clients I work with expect me to be able to bring issues forward and help them find solutions, even when the issues may be non-financial. I think the tough part of planning is marrying our goals and dreams, and sometimes having the conversations that we don't want to have as part of a respectful, patient dialogue. So Jim, this is an especially timely message, I think, as we head into a brand new year. Many of us concerned about our financial situation and the economy, but we're not quite sure where to start. Do you really think Christmas is a logical time for this? Absolutely. You know, when families get together, which is kind of rare these days, um, we just don't get that much time anymore. When I talk to families about their choices, uh, when it comes to dividing charitable dollars, it's a great place to start the discussion around the importance of financial planning. So let's talk a little bit about how you help families as they navigate charitable giving conversations. Money is one of the most powerful tools that we have to teach children life skills, and it makes sense to bring the kids in on some of the decision making. Joanne, you know, explaining the, the logic behind financial decisions opens the conversation to an exploration of family values. Imagine talking to kids about their hobbies and interests and how conversations like these can lead to a discovery of causes and charities perhaps that they might like to support. These types of conversations can foster a sense of awareness and compassion for others that may be less fortunate. So what's one way for parents to help their children see their values in action? I'd like to suggest starting with an exercise that engages the whole family in the decision-making process. A long-time family client of mine uh, organizes their charitable bequest uh, by putting uh, 100 dried beans on the, on the dining room table, with each one representing 1% of their annual giving. They then divide the beans into piles representing the amount that they'd like to donate to various local and global causes, and then they review the organizations together collectively as a family before allocating, uh, allocating the beans uh, appropriately. Oh, this is great. I love this concept of interactive family discussions. Charitable giving is a great example of breaking down basics involved in the decision-making process. Well, thanks, Joanne. We spend a lot of time considering the different ways that we can bring value to our audience. So my guess is that any family that tries this 100 bean exercise would find an opportunity to learn more about each other at the same time, to hear more about which issues and causes matter most to each individual and, of course, why. It's a great way to learn more about each other. So I have to ask, what do you recommend if the kids are already grown? Has the chance to create a family mission already passed? Not at all. Okay, it's a great uh, a conversation to start having. Okay, uh, it's also helpful to have it when they're young. But remember, the conversation needs to be appropriate for the age of the kids. So even young adults or adult kids have their own families. A great place to get the ball rolling around the dinner table could be asking maybe these types of questions. Okay, what is the organization? Um, what do they do? Uh, why are you choosing it? And what will your donation be used for? 
Jim, these are the richest types of conversations for the family to share, giving the kids a, an actual opportunity to learn the value of responsible giving while learning about each family member's values and interests. It is very powerful. Many clients who are involved with philanthropic endeavors have told me that they learned uh, those values from their parents and grandparents, and they seek a balance between honoring family legacy and supporting the causes they've discovered. They fund many of these same causes that their families support and give locally, so long as the philanthropy fits with their personal values. And part of this framework involves a written financial plan. Charity starts at home, and there's really not a better time to start the tradition than during a traditional time of year, Christmas. Absolutely. For the affluent families that I work with, it's not just a matter of how much to give, but how to give, or what to give, even when to give. You have two main options when it comes to charitable giving. You can give uh, a gift during your lifetime or bequest upon death. Many families that I work with, they do both. When a gift has a significant value or the person making the gift is elderly and vulnerable, you may want to pay special attention to legal concerns. And of course, one thing that often gets overlooked, current and future tax considerations. We want to make sure that these considerations are taken into account as part of their written financial plan. Well, I'm certain, Jim, that our listeners can relate to this scenario on both fronts, but the bottom line is you need a plan. Many of those families, uh, uh, those same families, would like uh, a say in how their donations are used. So they're quite interested in things like donor-advised funds. Other families are looking for help on how to donate their capital once they're gone, uh, but would like to live on the income uh, from these investments in the meantime. Well, is that something you do or something you could help with? I'm truly honored to be able to help families with situations like both of these. I wish I'd mentioned this earlier, but the example we just spoke of is, is called a charitable remainder trust. Um, actually, can you just go over that uh, quickly again? Tell us what is a charitable remainder trust? Well, the charitable remainder trust allows the capital to go to an end beneficiary, which is, say, a charity, but you get to live off of the income in the meantime. You spoke of teachable moments earlier, and as families get together over the holidays, do you have a story that you wanted to share about this? I do. One of our family friends has a, has a large extended family, and when they get together over the holidays every year, they meet with a mission to help the less fortunate with a donation on behalf of their entire family. Over the years, as the grandchildren have grown up, the format of their charitable outreach has shifted from and become a, a festive event for the whole family that they look forward to and want to participate in. There are nine grandkids in the family, ranging from age from, from 3 to 15, with three kids per family. The cousins form groups and choose a charity support. As a unit, they uh, formulate a proposal, and then a spokesman uh, is chosen to present the idea to the family. After each group is presented, the family confers and elects which cause to support. It's a wonderful way for the family to share their values and show support for each other, and of course the community. Oh, that's a great story, Jim. This family sounds like they've got great communication skills. It can be difficult for parents to talk to the kids about money, but uh, how would you help them start a conversation around charitable giving, just like this family? If I have a chance to facilitate a family meeting with parents that have money and their adult children, and then I ask them how they want to make a difference in the world, it opens their eyes and takes some of the anxiety away because now they have a purpose for their money. The families that I work with have, that really have accomplished this best are the families who create a family values statement. Well, Jim, this sounds like an excellent idea. It sounds like powerful experience to share with one's family. So if one has never put something like this together, where do we start? It doesn't have to be a heavy exercise. As I mentioned earlier, can start with a conversation around the dinner table. If you want to carry it further, a few other areas to touch on could be is what does your family stand for? What do we as a family value? What does it mean to be a member of this family? And what does our family believe when it comes to helping the less fortunate? Well, it's so important to remember that we're teaching the next generation about these values as well. For families open to this conversation, what an absolutely wonderful way to consider starting the new year. Uh, so speaking of the new year, do you have any suggestions as to how we empower our kids with the 
financial literacy skills that they need to thrive in 2016? And just to clarify, when I say kids, what age are we really talking about? We're talking about the whole gamut uh, from young to adult children, of course, age-appropriate discussions. Sounds great. Okay, so how do we empower these kids with the skills that they need for next year? Remember that through ongoing financial, uh, family financial conversations, you can have a positive influence in helping your children formulate and follow through on their 2016 financial resolutions. I borrowed the, the following tips from my uh, work with Junior Achievement as a program educator. Encourage your children's efforts uh, uh, to setting goals by teaching them to compose, practice, and pursue their financial goals according to a goal management technique known as SMART. Stop and think, make a plan, ask questions, review information, and take action. It's great. I like the idea of being smart. So give us a rundown now of how to accomplish these goals. I'd love to. Start by establishing tangible goals, such as saving 10% of earnings or allowance over the next three months. Another idea is to have the kids jot down their goals to visualize and reinforce their significance. This can help remind your kids to allocate money every month to achieve their financial goals. And it's a great reminder to think about their spending choices. Well, it sounds like money isn't just an initial conversation, it's an ongoing conversation. Oh, exactly. Talk about fundamentals and start early on, raising the scope and expectation as your kids or grandkids grow older. I remember a parent telling me recently about their young son when they said they couldn't afford something. And like many small children, he said, well, why don't you just go to the bank and get more? I've heard this before. So clearly this child is not grasping that money is a finite resource. Another couple told me a great story about using Monopoly money to help their kids understand the concept of budgeting and financial decision making. And you know, this is a tough one for some parents because they, they don't want to get into this detail. But what it really did was it represented their, their net monthly income in Monopoly money. And they asked the kids to guess what they thought the various ongoing monthly costs of running a family were. They then produced a bill and took that amount of Monopoly money from the pile. Once they had finished, uh, they talked about their discretionary and variable expenses, and then they said, this is as a family what we have left over. They said, in our family, we believe that we should do the following with what's left over. Save a fixed percentage for long term. Be prepared to give a small amount away to charity or to the less fortunate, and that it was okay to spend some of it and enjoy some of it now. The more time you have to prepare for things, the better choices you might end up making. Everybody's looking for ways to take a little stress off the table around the holidays. Joanne, I think the other aspect is, is what we're teaching our children and what they're seeing is how we approach our shopping and expense-related choices. So Jim, as we wrap up our show for today, what are a few impactful financial planning life skills that we could offer our listeners to help point their kids in the right direction? Start uh, uh, to communicate uh, to your kids the importance of setting aside savings to pay themselves first before they start spending freely. It's about creating good financial habits. And modeling responsible and healthy financial habits and decision making is a super idea. Continue to stress uh, uh, your kids how to comparison shop uh, and live within their means. And I've been amazed by a story of clients whose university-bound kids feel that these are foreign concepts. <laughs> and we have talked about that in other shows as well. So set your kids up to flourish in 2016. Make it a resolution this holiday season to reinforce and grow your children's financial literacy skills with the tools that they need to prepare them to take steps towards their own financial independence. A couple of final messages if I could. And it's not just about choosing investments. Financial planning involves finances and money and family. And of course, we'd like people to remember the three T's, time to do the research and anticipate the tax consequences, technique, knowing what you're doing with knowledge, and of course, temperament. We're talking about emotional control. 
confidence in your own financial situation and your options goes a long way to helping create a better outcome. You're listening to Boomer Life on CL650. I'm Joanne Sutton. Today, we're speaking with Jim Doyle, Senior Financial Consultant with Investors Group. And as we move into 2016, it could be a great time to re-examine financial habits and patterns to help us develop healthy financial habits for 2016. So next show, mark this on your calendar, December 29th, we're going to have Jim walk us through a few ways that we can kickstart our year and start working towards creating and completing our New Year's financial bucket list. To learn more about Jim Doyle and how he helps financially comfortable Canadians and to find out exactly how he can renew your sense of confidence and purpose through following a well laid out written financial plan, it's as easy as giving him a phone call. 604-682-5431. So good luck with the Christmas shopping and the budgeting. Jim, thanks so much for being here today and uh, all your words of wisdom. It's been a pleasure. So good luck with the Christmas shopping and the budgeting. Thanks for joining us today on Boomer Life on CL650.